Yeah, no scientists want to go out there and say it. That's the problem. We are clueless on this. That's the problem. And they go out there pontificating as if they know. That's the problem. And then they corrupt a whole generation after generation after generation. You know this. The poor guy on the street, the poor woman on the street, they don't know. They're fed a bunch of trash and they believe it. This is a debate between computational biologist Joshua Swamidas and chemist and nanotechnologist James Tour on the origin of life. Now, these guys are friends, but that doesn't stop the debate from getting kind of fiery, particularly toward a big clip in the end where James Tour gets Swamidas to agree with him and then Tour explains why he thinks that science has led the man on the street astray. Now, we have to set this thing up, so let's jump in as James Tour begins to make his case. They believe the narrative that there were some basic molecules like formaldehyde, like carbon dioxide, like, like cyanide in a pool and lightning strikes and molecules formed and those then formed a cell and those then formed living creatures that came out of the pond. That's the narrative and that's actually what most scientists believe. And so, uh, uh, and, and, and if you ask them, give me a basis for that, they have absolutely no basis for it. That's what they were taught in school. So even that idea has infected even the highest levels of the academy. It's not that they say, hey, I, I, wanna, I want to uh, confound the public today, so let me see what I can say that's not true. But they've bought into this narrative. And this narrative was put out by a small subsection of scientists that, that work in this area of origin of life and have put this forward. And that, in a sense, it's somewhat understandable when you had the Miller-Urey experiment and you had these, these flashes of voltages so, but, over but these molecules. Clear, it's and, not, and, there shouldn't be a problem with saying that it's possible this happened, but you're saying that it's moved from just being a narrative that's possible to being a narrative that happened. Is that what the objection is? Yeah, but it's more than that. I mean, Tell me more. I mean there's gradations here. If you look at the chemistry, it is so improbable. I mean, just the chemistry just doesn't work. You got to make all the four classes of molecules and then you got to assemble them all and none of that works. So it's not just, oh, well, it's possible, but we don't know for sure. If you're going to say it's possible, you got to put some substance around the possibility. Put okay, some me, weight on these bones and there is none. I want to know how you let rule this out because I've even talked to you about this privately and I want to know how you rule it out. Would you agree that even what we know now that there is a unimaginably small but non-zero probability of the first life coming together by natural processes. It's unimaginably small, but it's not it's but it's not exactly zero. It's a little bit more than zero. I'm okay with that. Okay. So then um, and then you'd also agree with me that we've only observed life here on Earth. Correct. And by all uh, all indications indicate there was only one origin of life here on Earth, right? Unless, you know, you're going to say special creation. No, no, but... I mean, the universe is big. We've only looked at a very small part of the universe. But, so the, but all the, I can second part, Yeah, so let me get to that. So then, so okay. then you'd also agree that the universe is unimaginably large, much larger than what we observe. Yes. So then that's like an unimaginably large number, the size of the unobservable universe, not just the observable one, multiplied times an unimaginably tiny number, that's undefined. You don't know what the probability is. No, 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 no. Look, you, you can play this game with anything. You can say, well, there, 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 there might be some farm, because you haven't looked at all the farms where pigs fly. There might be. <laughs> there, there, it's a, it's a non-zero number, right, Joshua? It's a non-zero number. I mean, you can play this game forever. You no, have no, to put no, no, some science around this. You have to think about the... No, 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 no. You can't do this. You have to put some things around this where you say, okay, what are the molecules you're going to have to have for life? How are those molecules going to be made? How are they going to have to assemble? How does that then form a cell? And we are absolutely clueless on this. And you say, well, it's well, non-zero. I agree. Okay, yes, but, it's non-zero. And the universe is extra big. And then you can throw at me that there's an infinite number of universes, which means that there's another one of you, Joshua Swamidas, and another one of me at this instant no, 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 in, no. Another, right. in another world doing exactly I what we're say, doing in broadcasting this. I didn't say infinite.
Okay, now we're going to play that big clip where James Tour kind of goes off. But it's important to say that this is what we see all the time with design arguments in general. No matter how ridiculously unlikely it is, uh, as long as it's not technically zero, technically impossible, then no matter how unlikely it is, we still don't have to believe in God. Now, Josh Swamidas is a believer, but it still bears mentioning that this often happens in design discussions, particularly with the fine-tuning of the universe for life. We've got science who are in some cases willing to posit a literally infinite number of other universes in order to raise the odds that this could happen by chance and escape design. For example, cosmologist Alan Guth says the fine tuning of our universe can be explained by the multiverse hypothesis. In an infinite multiverse, we would expect some universes to have the right conditions for life, and we simply happen to live in one of those, end quote. What's more unbelievable, a literally infinite number of other universes or design. But now here's the big moment. I didn't say infinite. I, I said unimaginably large. Um, and, and I have to agree with everything you just said there. I agree that we don't know how it happened. I agree that it seems extremely unlikely. It, it just seems that we're kind of at the limit of science. Like, so I'm not saying that it happened by natural processes. I, I'm just saying I don't know how to get past that mathematical no. problem of like a come tiny number multiplied by a big guys. number. Come and clean with it, Joshua. You're as clueless as I am, as everybody else, on how life formed. Okay? I agree. Say it. This yes, is I am. the problem. I agree. No I'm scientists true. want to go out there and say it. That's the problem. We are clueless on this. That's the problem, and they go out there pontificating as if they know. That's the problem. And then they corrupt a whole generation after generation after generation so that now even the professors in the academy Whoa, have bought so into this because they corrupt? Look at what, what the data. When you look at the data, then you go like, wow, I am clueless. Nobody knows how anything of that is done. Now, Joshua can agree with that. I agree that we don't know how how life arose by natural processes, but I, I don't said think, it again. I think every scientist I've talked to thinks that. So the, the, the question becomes every scientist you've talked to, nobody will confess this openly. <laughs> nobody does. They don't. Oh, well, how did this work? Oh, the foremost reaction and you get a protocell and, oh, and there's, 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 there's enzymatic you know, reaction. We should start just interviewing like a hundred scientists that will all agree with us on this. Cause this is like, it seems like this is non-controversial. No, this is not non-controversial. The poor folks out there that are listening think that I, uh, scientists understand where life came from. You got to get back down in the trenches, leave your laboratory, get back down and talk to the common person on the street, Joshua. Well, oh, hey, look, I'm see- joining with you right now. I think that it's not just me. I think that, um, I think that most scientists agree that we don't know how the first cell arose. Now, I think I think part of what's going on, I mean, this is why it's puzzling to me, I have to say. And, you know, I talk, to, I talk to the public, too. And you're right. I do think there is a bit of a mythos or a mythology that somehow arisen up. A bit. You think? Oh, no, I agree with you. It's just I haven't known. I don't know. There you said it again. Like, I agree with you. What? You said it again that you agree with me. But I mean, among, that among we're the, clueless. I, you you agree with me that we're clueless on how life formed. You agree with you know, that? I did say agree, but I mean, do you really want to say? Yeah, there clues? you go. You said it again. We have some clues. I would say it's kind of like we're trying to bridge across the Grand Canyon, and it's not like we haven't ventured out a little bit past the cliff. We're nowhere near crossing it, but Joshua, it, the the Grand Canyon gets further separated every year as we learn the complexity of the cell. That's the problem. In 1952, 1953, with Miller-Urey, we thought we were close because we didn't understand the complexity of a cell. Now, well, every I mean, year, that, we understand more because of guys about, like you, you who tell us how complex this thing is, and we go, oh, wow, the goalposts move further away. Your Grand Canyon has split further apart. So this tells us we're not getting closer. We're getting further because the target's getting further away. Well, I mean, maybe, but I mean, I, I start the story at a different point. I'm a little bit younger. So when I was in high school, it was really clear that Miller Urey wouldn't tell you how the origin of life arose. Like, I, I never went through that. Oh, Joshua, Joshua, you are so clueless as to what the person on the street thinks about this. Okay, They're but here's the thing. Miller I don't think we have in to high say school that right now, and it's related that we have no to idea. Of life, and they show you a pond, and they show you lightning strikes and molecules forming cells and a, and a, and a lizard come, coming out 
That's what they learn in high school. That's what they learn in high school, Joshua. You, you're remarkable. I mean, you're one of the smartest guys I know. And so you know this poor guy on the street, the poor woman on the street. They don't know. They're fed a bunch of trash and they believe it. I can certainly speak for atheists I encounter online who certainly seem to think that scientists have just about got this licked. Yet my friend and scientist Cy Gart says that the origin of life is almost like a second big bang. But to put it in perspective, if some natural process were discovered that led to first life, it wouldn't disturb my belief in God one bit. I'd just be amazed at the way God set up the universe such that life would emerge like this. On the other hand, if there's not a natural process for first life, that certainly is inhospitable to the atheist position. And I agree that the man on the street deserves to know the truth about the science here. Now listen, science comes up every now and then in the God discussion, and there's a whole lot more to talk about particularly when it comes to cosmology and the beginning of the universe and fine-tuning for life. So click the video that's on the screen right now to get more of that interesting field of discussion. And before you leave, I'd love it if you'd like, comment, and subscribe.